Hello ladies and gentlemen, Central here. Today I want to briefly discuss remote ID for model aircraft and other unmanned aerial systems. I'll discuss the major problems I see with its current implementation as it relates to compliance and sustainability as well as how it could be better implemented to meet the desired goals remote ID supposedly seeks to achieve. First, a summation of the remote ID rule as it is now. As it is currently being implemented with the FAA's final rule on the matter, remote ID would require every single remotely operated unmanned aerial system, UAS, including recreational fixed-wing model aircraft, radio control helicopters, and multi-rotor drones, to be fitted with some form of surveillance broadcast unit giving the location of the UAS and operator to anyone with a receiver that can intercept the broadcast transmission. The only exception to this rule would be flight within an FAA-recognized identification area, or FRIA for short. Think model aircraft fields under the control of some form of community modeling association like the AMA. This remote ID rule is not only a headache for recreational model aircraft flyers, for reasons we'll get into, but it also fails to provide any meaningful benefit to the public while adding to the negative ecological footprint of human activity. What are the problems? Well, one of the unfortunate impacts of adding a remote broadcast unit to model aircraft that is overlooked is the waste byproducts that will result. There'll be more printed circuit boards, more wires, more plastic, and more batteries needed in order to make these broadcast units a reality and these will end up creating more unnecessary pollution during their creation, during their use, as we will discuss shortly, and in their disposal as they inevitably fail. With an estimated number nearing 900,000 recreational UAS in the United States alone, the potential ecological impact for remote ID cannot be ignored. This alone should trigger an immediate revision to the rule. A more sustainable model for implementation will be suggested by the end of this video. Another thing to consider is recreational UAS performance. When it comes to aviation, whether we're talking about manned or unmanned aviation, weight is a big deal. Every pound, or in the case of small recreational UAS, every gram makes a difference. The cost of remote ID isn't just monetary although it will prove to be cost prohibitive for some, especially those in less affluent communities. It's also costly when it comes to performance. The vast majority of UAS barely have enough performance to fly for even a few minutes without the additional dead weight that will be added by a remote ID broadcast unit. Even the smallest of these units will have a detrimental effect on performance that will only be overcome with larger models and or more powerful motors, batteries, etc. This will pose an additional cost to the users as they have to upgrade their models to accommodate remote ID to meet their needs. That's in addition to the cost of the remote ID broadcast unit itself. This also means more waste, adding to the ecological impact, and it will add to the potential dangers involved. As weight goes up on any given UAS, wing loading increases as well as the associated potential energy of the craft. The added inefficiency also means more energy will need to be expended per flight, which adds to the ecological impact. That brings us to compliance. Let's face it, bad actors never comply with the law. Even if most recreational UAS operators complied with this final rule, which is highly unlikely, the people that remote ID is supposed to protect the public against, terrorists, criminals, foreign agents, etc., will absolutely not be in compliance. So an economic, ecological, and social cost will be levied against the general public who simply want to enjoy recreational UAS operations for no positive gain. Realizing this, many recreational UAS operators will simply not comply. Many will do so simply because they don't know about the FAA's final rule on remote ID. The potential therefore exists that otherwise law-abiding, innocent people will be exposed to legal troubles including fines or even imprisonment, while bad actors, who are cautious, circumvent the rule with impunity. Such an outcome would be an absolute travesty 
and a serious miscarriage of justice. So what can be done? What you're looking at here is a publicly accessible, real-time map that you can use for flight planning purposes for general aviation. Up here we can see that there are some TFRs or temporary flight restrictions where flight is essentially completely restricted. But the map also shows other airspace. And what I want to home in on here is this. Everything within these blue lines is considered Class Bravo airspace. It's a positive control zone. You cannot enter this area without a couple of things. One of those is a transponder that gives your location and altitude information, similar to the requirements of the remote ID rule. And it also requires that you establish two-way communications with the controlling airspace. You have to get permission to enter. And of course, you can see the various altitudes associated with each segment of the uh, blue circles here. But all in all, to enter this airspace, you have to have essentially a remote ID as well as two-way communication. There are other forms of airspace as well, such as uh, Class C airspace, Class D airspace. However, you see that all of these are like little islands in a big sea of what is otherwise uncontrolled airspace. A lot of this at ground level up to 700 feet is going to be considered Class G. Some of that above it is Class G as well, but a lot of this is also Class E airspace. Either way, you're not required to have that uh, transponder to fly in that uncontrolled airspace, nor are you required to establish two-way communication. And as you can see, there's a lot more uncontrolled airspace than controlled airspace. I'm going to show you another graphic now which explains this uh, a little bit better. What we're looking at here is another publicly available resource from the FAA itself, ironically enough. This is showing uh, a PDF of Chapter 15 of the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. And what we're discussing here in, uh, in this chapter is airspace. And so the model that is used for general aviation uh, is actually quite simple and could be implemented on a UAS level as well. So what we've got is we've got different classifications of airspace going all the way from G, which is uncontrolled airspace, all the way up to Class A. Now we're not going to talk about Class A because it's not really necessary for what we're going to be discussing here. But let's start with uh, Class G. So there's no specific requirements for flying in Class G. You basically can fly uh, anything you want there. You can fly a homemade aircraft with no transponders, just uh, fine in Class G. Uh, same with Class E, although it can be controlled um, for IFR operations. So as long as you're flying VFR, again, in Class E, there's no requirement for any kind of uh, transponder. There's no requirement for radio communications. This is uh, uh, basically... Uh, the way all of the airspace has been for model aircraft, where there's been no requirements for broadcast. And this is the way it should be. However, once you get into Class D airspace, then things change. You've got to have two-way radio communication. When you get into Class C, you've got to have two-way radio communication, as well as a transponder with altitude reporting. Same for Class Bravo. So when you get into these more active airspaces, you start to have a requirement for a, a transponder or a remote ID. So, as you can see, the vast majority of airspace is not controlled. Once you get into controlled airspace, you need a transponder. The exact same model, again, could be used for model aircraft, where if we're talking about sensitive areas, perhaps uh, uh, public events or public buildings, uh, like a governmental building, um, perhaps the capital, perhaps the uh, state capital or the capital of the nation, you could understand where you might want to restrict UAS operations. Same could be applied for uh, uh, runways or airports. Uh, you have a class Bravo, you don't want UAS flying around in it, you could have restrictions on that. If you are going to operate in those areas, you, of course, would need to uh, have a remote ID and establish two-way communication. Same that uh, same deal that general aviation has to uh, abide by, you could apply that to uh, recreational UAS.
But if a recreational UAS is flying, let's say, below 400 feet and flying away from uh, those sensitive areas out in the middle of nowhere, you could treat that like Class G, uncontrolled airspace, where you would have no requirement for any kind of broadcast or radio communications. This is the way it should be done. After all, this is the way it's done for manned aviation. It could easily be implemented for unmanned aviation as well, and it would not have nearly the ecological or economic impact that requiring remote ID would. So what we have here is my proposal for airspace classifications for UAS operations, and as you can see, it's far simpler than it is even for manned aviation. What you have is uncontrolled airspace, which would be the vast majority of land area, and that would cover airspace all the way from the surface to 400 uh, feet AGL, and in that airspace there would be no requirement for remote ID. The next level up from that would be controlled airspace, and as far as UAS operations are concerned, that would be any area that was designated uh, as sensitive from the surface to 400 feet AGL, as well as all airspace above 400 feet AGL. That would be controlled, it would require remote ID, and potentially also require two-way communication uh, with a controlling agency. The next step up from that, of course, would be restricted, and restricted would basically preclude all UAS operations, at least all recreational UAS operations. So where would you use the controlled and restricted airspace? Well, the controlled airspace uh, could, of course, be used around uh, airports. Um, you wouldn't necessarily want airports to be totally restricted. There may be certain situations where UAS operations would be called for in an airport environment, but you would want that to be controlled. So that would be one application for controlled airspace. Another uh, potential for controlled airspace would be operations in and around uh, sporting events. Sometimes there would be uh, the need for filming uh, a sporting event, so you might want that to be controlled where you could still have a uh, uh, UAS operation, but it would require a remote ID and, again, potentially two-way communication with the controlling authority. When it comes to restricted, that would be around uh, very sensitive areas, perhaps military um, bases, uh, perhaps governmental buildings like the Capitol, that sort of thing. That's where you would have your restricted airspace. So it would be very simple, and it would mean that the vast majority of flights which would be conducted in uncontrolled airspace would not require the remote ID, and you wouldn't have the impact uh, the economic impact, you wouldn't have the ecological impact, because there wouldn't be as many remote ID units being produced or used. Beyond that, it would be a lot less expensive and a lot easier to implement a public resource like the map I showed you earlier, which is updated so that you can see what uh, airspace restrictions there currently are. That would be very easy to put out, and that way anybody who's planning to uh, do some sort of UAS operation could always just check that free resource, see what the airspace around them looks like, and see if they're good to fly. This would greatly reduce the burden for everybody. It would reduce the burden for the UAS operator. It would reduce the burden for law enforcement. It would reduce the burden for government. It's just a better idea all around. Anyway, let me know what you think about this in the comment section below and share this video with anybody you think might find it of interest. Also, don't forget to like. The more likes that this video gets, the more it'll get promoted by the YouTube algorithm.